Luke, this fifth chapter in verse 26, records that they were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. That phrase, we have seen strange things today, is an appropriate description of our Lord and Master Jesus the Christ. <clears throat> it was one of the outstanding and distinctive characteristics of Christ, and that which gave him so much of his appeal. <clears throat> his life from his birth to his ascension back into heaven was marked by wonders, surprises, amazements. It was distinctive in every aspect that you can think of. That type of distinctiveness likewise becomes the power of Christianity. And when you lose that distinctiveness, you lose the power of Christianity. The power of the church, the Lord's church, is that it is different than anything else in the world. Any other religion in the world. It's not where we are like them, it's where we are not like them. Jesus asked the question to his disciples in Matthew 5 and verse 47, that if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans the same? In other words, if in saluting your brethren only, then you're nothing like anyone else. Everyone's the same. Everyone does that. There's no distinctiveness between you and them. And so the church needs to do things that are more than others, more for the world than the religions of the world, the denominations. Answer the true questions of life in order to be truly the Lord's church. But this afternoon... I want us to address it from the standpoint that the church is distinctive and strange in that it has a divine message. The power of the church is, in reality, its message. We know that the gospel is God's power to save, Romans 1.16. The gospel, that's the message. We read in 1 Corinthians 1st chapter this morning about Paul's responsibility not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, I'm preaching the gospel. He's going to preach baptism. But it was that preaching the gospel that gave power to the message, power to what he was doing, power to Christianity, that... The, <coughs> the world seeks other things, but if you really want to be distinctive, if you want to be Christ's church, then you're going to have to preach this divine message. The Bible truly is not the product of human production. It did not come from man. Man might have been the human instrument, but man did not write it. In that sense, man was not the author of it. God is. In Galatians first chapter, verses 11 and verse 12, Paul speaks about his own situation. And he says, I certify you, brethren, <clears throat> that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of, Je of Jesus Christ. Here's this gospel that I'm preaching, and he says very specifically, it is not of man. Instead, it came from the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ directly revealed it to Paul, directly revealed it to the rest of the apostles. 
mentioned uh, 1 Corinthians, the, uh, the first chapter, and how that we read through much of that this morning in relationship to the fact that we preach a divine message and that the wisdom of God is greater than the, well, really the foolishness of man. But in the, chap- in the second chapter, he begins dealing with the fact that he did not come with excellency of speech, the wisdom of this world, but he came declaring, verse 1, the testimony of God. Uh, And I'll just, as an aside here, there are some translations, and I call, I use the term loosely there, that instead of stating the testimony of, of God, have the testimony about God. The distinction is the testimony of God shows the source of origin. The source of origin of this testimony is from God. The testimony about God, on the other hand, makes the origin themselves and what they are saying about God. It is truly a perversion of God's Word to translate it and using that t- term, the testimony about God. It's not the testimony about God. It is a testimony that comes from God, not about Him. It deals with being about Him, but this is the source of origin. It comes from Him. But then he goes on to say that he determined not to know anything among them, save (coughs) Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why? Because that's the power of Christianity. That's that divine message. And he explains how that the wisdom of this world, through that wisdom we would not know God. And then in verse 9, he makes a statement that I, it is written, I hath not seen, neither ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. The things that God hath prepared for them that love him is his message. He's dealing with the message of Christianity, that gospel, and now which he preached and determined not to know anything other than that. And he's saying that message... Man would not know. It would not come into man's thoughts, man's ideas on his own. It takes revelation to do that. And so notice the very next verse, verse 10, when he says, But God hath revealed them unto us. God revealed that message to man. The us, they're actually dealing with the apostles. God gave this message directly to us. We couldn't determine it. We would not determine it on on our own and by our own thoughts and our own devices. But God has revealed it. He's revealed it, there he goes on, by His Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit directly guiding these men into what they say and we also find what they wrote. And he uses now, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. There's an illustration. I don't know you except as you reveal your spirit, your nature to me. I, you don't know me except as I reveal myself to you. So, here's God. No man knows God on his own except as God reveals him. How does he do that? By the Spirit. And so he goes on. Uh, Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things freely given to us of God. So we can know God. How? By that revelation that he has given to us. He then says, which things also we speak, 
there's their language, their speech, that it's not man's ideas, man's thoughts, but that which they are speaking is that which has been revealed from God by the Spirit. So which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom giveth or teacheth. Man's wisdom couldn't know God, couldn't know the things of God. We can only know God and the things of God by the Spirit that reveals Him to us. And they would then speak those things. And so, which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The idea is, here is spiritual things, spiritual ideas. How do we come to know that? By the spiritual words which the Holy Spirit is giving to them. And through those words which the Holy Spirit is giving them to speak, they then could reveal God to us and the things of God, those spiritual things. Thus the message which they spoke came directly from God. The message was what was important. It is a divine message. And if we want to know those things that are spiritual things, then we have to go to that message that God revealed to the apostles by the Holy Spirit. Later on in the book, in chapter 14, Paul tells us and adds to this thought <coughs> when he says, If any man think himself to be spiritual, or think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of God. Now in chapter 2, he dealt with the speech. We are speaking the words which the Holy Spirit gave, gave unto us so that we can know those spiritual things. Now then in chapter 14, he adds to those, that speech that which we have written. That which we wrote. What is it? It's the commandments of God. But wait a minute, Paul. Aren't you the one writing the letter? Yes, but it is the Holy Spirit that is revealing those words of which I am writing. It is a, thus a message that comes directly from God as revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. And thus in St. Saint Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul can say that all Scripture is inspired of God. That word, phrase, inspired of God, comes from one Greek word, which literally means God breathed. God breathed into the Scripture his life-giving message. In Genesis, the first chapter, <clears throat> God breathed into man the breath of life. He now breathes into Scripture the breath of life. The one gave physical life, this gives spiritual life. The power of the gospel is in that spiritual life that has been written down for us, the scripture. He goes on to say that it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But notice the results of this scripture, this inspired of God scripture. Man of God, that the man of God may be perfect. That word means complete full grown, mature. We are everything that God expects us to be. <coughs> then thoroughly or thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If you want to know what a good work is, go to the Bible and find out. Because the Bible reveals all good works. And we can be completely or thoroughly furnished to those good works by a knowledge of God's will and acting upon it. Concerning the Old Testament, Peter would write in St. Peter 1, verse 20 and 23, or 20 and 21, knowing this first, and by the way, that phrase, knowing this first, 
is not setting forth a matter of um, order. It is stating, here's an important matter. You need to understand this. Without an understanding of this, nothing else will really matter. Knowing this first, <clears throat> then no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For, <clears throat> for the prophecy came not in old time. Now, the old time is dealing with those Old Testament prophets. And that's the Old Testament. Oh, that prophecy came in old time, by the, not by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved. Literally, the word is carried along by the Holy Ghost. They were carried along in what they wrote and what they said. So that those individuals were revealing God's word. The divine message. That divine message is truth. In John the 8th chapter and verse 32, Jesus says, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now how does that truth come? It comes by means of God's word. That's the truth. That is God's word. You cannot separate truth from God's word. God's word reveals truth to us. And through that truth, we can be made free. In John 17 and verse 17, thus Jesus would pray, to sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. God's word is truth, but ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free, so you shall know, you can come to know God's word. And through that word, you can be made free. Now, we're not talking about physical freedom. We're talking about spiritual freedom. Freedom from sin and the bondage of sin. The power of sin over our life. We can be freed from that. How? By God's word. Think of all of those passages. For example, the 119th Psalm in verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It is through God's word that we overcome sin. What is it? You'll be made free. It is by the truth that we are, our souls are purified. 1 Peter, the first chapter, uh, in verse 22 and 23. You purified your souls in obeying the truth by the Spirit. And so that Spirit purifies our souls. That truth, God's Word, sets us free spiritually. But what about if that truth, God's Word, is mixed with error? Then that becomes and makes the Word of God powerless. It is truth unmixed with error that saves, that makes us free. Other religions have some truth. Many of them have a great deal of truth. But the problem is that that truth is laced with the doctrines of man in addition to the truth, or in substitution to the truth. It is stated that rat poison is 98% good, but it's the 2% that kills. Truth, mixed with a little bit of error, destroys. <clears throat> when Jesus condemns the Pharisees, and as you re start reading Matthew, the 23rd chapter, he doesn't say that everything that they teach is wrong, that everything that they say is error. And in fact, he says, whatsoever they command you, that do and abide. And you do those things, but don't do after their deeds. He recognized that there was truth that they would teach. 
but that truth was mixed with error. You have, for example, in Matthew, the 15th chapter, they had substituted God's word for, with the traditions and the commandments of men. And thus he says, your worship is vain, it's worthless, verse 9. Why? Because that truth that they had and that they taught, mixed with error, made their worship of no effect, of no value. It was worthless, vain worship. We, the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, have truth. We have God's Word. As long as we do not start mixing in error with that truth, we remain and the power still remains there. You see that power in the days of the apostles. During the restoration which was needed here in the United States of America in the early 1800s, you see men who simply called people back to the, to the Bible. And we're going to follow the Bible and do what the Bible says and nothing more, nothing less. And thus, there was a great explosion of the Lord's church during that time. Why? Because we're getting away from the doctrines of men. We're going to exclude the ideas, the doctrines, the synods, all of these things that mixes some error with truth. And we're going to get back to only truth. When you look at the denominations of men, you see that they follow manuals and creeds, catechisms, and all of these other things other than simply God's Word. There is a story, supposedly true, that, uh, and this would have been years ago, that a school asked different religious leaders in their area to come in and basically tell us about yourself. And one after another would hold up, this is the book that we follow. And it was a catechism or a manual that they followed. And then one from the Lord's church stood up and said, we only follow the Bible, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. It was distinctive because All of the denominations follow creeds and catechisms and doctrines of men and not simply the Bible. One of the things that makes the Lord's church distinctive from them is that we do not believe that it is right to add to God's Word. And when I say that, I'm dealing with the silence of the Scriptures that if the Bible does not authorize an action, then that action is sinful. You've added something to God's Word that God did not add. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, no, don't take anything away from God's Word. But when it comes to that silence of the Scriptures, and they teach that silence is permissive. If the Bible doesn't say not to do it, then we can do it. But yet, that's not the principles that are set forth in the Bible. That's adding to God's Word. We do those things only as God authorizes us to do them, either explicitly or implicitly. And that's where the power of the church is today, getting back to that original Word, that original document, the New Testament without addition, without subtraction, without substitution. And it's that same gospel which is able to save your souls. Again, we go to Romans 1, 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Gospel is God's power to save. You change God's word, that gospel, with the doctrines of men, and you have something other than the gospel. James 1 and verse 23, you were told to lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the, <coughs> the engrafted, or literally <coughs> the implanted word which is able to save your souls. You take that word of God and you plant it into the good and honest heart and that is able to save someone's soul. Take something that is different than the gospel because you've added something to it, you substituted something for it and you plant that in that heart then it does not save. It loses its power and it loses its strength. The church of Christ has a divine message. We must adhere to it. But then the church is distinctive and strange in that it enables a person to see himself as he is. The gospel truly is a mirror of the soul. In 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, we have that uh, great chapter on love in which he shows the great necessity of love in the first three verses. He shows its characteristics in verses 4 through verse 8, or the first part of verse 8. And then he deals with the enduring nature of love as opposed to the passing nature of miraculous powers. And that the miraculous powers were going to end when the completed revelation of God's message is given, or is written down. And so, the latter part of verse 8, <coughs> whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part. We only have a partial knowledge of that revelation. Why? Because it had not all been written down for them. So we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, the word perfect again means complete. When that which is perfect or complete is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. What was the in part? It was that prophesying by the miraculous powers that were given unto them by the, by the laying on of the apostles' hands, they only had a partial knowledge. They didn't have everything written down. And so it was in part. But when we have the completed revelation of God's Word, then those miracles will be done away with. They're no longer needed. But then notice, he uses a couple of illustrations. When I was a child, I, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. The childish area over here is that which is in part. It is that incomplete knowledge that came by the miraculous powers. Miraculous powers is childish in nature. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Manhood would be that which was perfect, that which was complete, the completed revelation written down for us in the New Testament. When I have that, I put away the childish things. I put away miraculous powers because they're no longer needed. I've outgrown them because now then I have that which was complete. But then notice this illustration. For now we see through a glass, word glass, we would translate it and think of it as mirror. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. <clears throat> For now we know, I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. <clears throat> Here he is, the mirror of God's word, is what he's saying. 
And now then, during this period of miraculous powers, when we do not have the completed revelation of God's Word, that that I'm looking into is obscure. I can't see clearly. I cannot see myself clearly. On the other hand, when we have the completed revelation of God's Word, then I'm able to see clearly. And that's the idea I see face to face. By the way, this has absolutely nothing to do with seeing God or seeing Jesus face to face in heaven or later on. It is dealing with God's Word through seeing my, I can see myself clearly through God's revelation, the Word of God. I can see myself as God sees me. Now then, repeatedly through the scriptures we're told, be not deceived. The greatest deceit is self-deceit. I can see myself clearly through the revelation of God's Word, but a lot of times I deceive myself into thinking I'm something that I'm not. But God's Word reveals us to ourselves. It allows me to see myself as I truly am. In James 1, in verse 23, you have much the same type of a illustration when he says, For if any man be a hearer of the <coughs> if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, this man is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass or in a mirror again. God's word allows him to see himself as he is. If he leaves God's word, he forgets what he is. You don't know yourself as you should. And so, verse 25, he goes on to say, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. That perfect law of liberty is completed revelation of God's word, that which we have in the New Testament today. One who looks into that perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. No man, you, me, no one else, can truly know himself until he sees the picture of himself in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The problem is that a lot of, through the denominational world and through all of the confusion that we have in this world, we confuse God's Word so that it makes it difficult for a person to see what he really is, to see himself as God sees him, to truly know himself. Christianity and the church makes a person realize really how far short we are of the divine goal. Remember in Romans 6, chapter and verse 23, or excuse me, the third chapter and verse 23. For all have sinned and, now notice this phrase, fallen short of the glory of God. Here's the glory of God. It is revealed within the pages of the New Testament. And when I look into those, that word, I can see myself and I can see how far short I am of that goal, of the glory of God. Paul would write in uh, Philippians 3, <coughs> verse 13 and 14, The brethren, <coughs> I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He says, I know that I will never have arrived in that sense. Throughout my life, I've got to continue pressing toward the mark. God has revealed himself within the pages of God's word, the Bible, and I have to continue stretching and reaching for that mark that it sets. 
And as I study the Bible and I read it and I learn the truths that are therein, I can see myself for what I truly am and I can see how far short I am of that sinless God, that one who is truly holy and righteous in everything that they do. The Bible, God's Word, gives us a message where we can truly see ourselves for what we are. It allows an individual to see that here's what I have to do to have my sins washed away. Because truly all have sinned. We have sinned. Every person who ever lives, when they reach an age of accountability, commits sin. What do they have to do in order to have their sins washed away? Well, the Bible reveals it. Man comes up with all sorts of ideas. He mixes a little bit of truth with error. Oh, you've got to believe. Well, that's right, you do. The Bible teaches such. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Got to believe. There's that truth that denominations teach. But then they start mixing in error. Put your hand on the TV or on the radio or what the, put your hand over your heart and say, I believe that Jesus Christ from, and they start saying a sinner's prayer. Where do you find such? Well, you don't. It's a little bit of truth mixed with error. But what does the Bible say? Well, we must have faith, Yes. But then we must repent because Jesus said, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 3 and verse 5. He told his apostles that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Luke 24, verse 46 and 47. The individual must repent, must make that confession. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Same confession that Peter made at Caesarea Philippi in Matthew the 16th chapter and verse 16. It's the same confession that that Ethiopian made before he was baptized in Acts the 8th chapter and verse 37. And then Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What does it take to be saved? Well, all you have to do is believe. But Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized. What about that part? Oh, well, the salvation comes at belief, and then you can be baptized if you really want to because it's only a confession of what you've done and the salvation that you have. But Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So if I want to be saved, what do I have to do? I have to believe, but I also have to be baptized in order to have salvation. And so the denominational world mixes a little truth with their error and thus they deceive many individuals and they make them feel like they are in a right relationship with God instead of that individual seeing what he really is. Still a lost sinner in need of salvation and in need of an obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the Christian, it sets forth the way in which we are to live, how we are to act, what we are to say, what we are to think, every aspect of our life. Yes, it sets forth those goals for us to meet. And we as Christians continue striving for that goal, that mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And when we fall short, as Simon the sorcerer did in Acts the 8th chapter. And we are revealed that we have committed sin. The same thing goes that for Simon the sorcerer that goes for us. The Bible teaches us that we repent and pray. And through that we can have the forgiveness of sins and thus be in that right relationship with God. Because we have obeyed truth. And truth unmixed with error. Now if you have need of an obedience to the gospel or if you have need of 
repenting as a child of God and coming back to faithfulness to Him, we would encourage you to do that as we stand and sing the invitation song.